Yo, 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 it's your boy H2O. Welcome to another edition of the New Balance Podcast. And as promised, we have another one for you on today. Listen, man, I'm so glad that you tuned in to this video. Um, we have some exciting things going on. And listen, if you've been following us uh, last month, we started a series called Marching Towards Manhood. And trust me, I have somebody in the building on today. Listen, buckle your seatbelts. It's going to get a little bumpy. It's going to get a little, little rough. But listen, if you ride it out, I promise you, your life is going to be the better. Listen, man, I have a guy on here, man. Um, I was talking to him last week, man. Our relationship goes back 41 years. Uh, it goes all the way back to Fort Pine for those who's watching it from East Texas, you know exactly what I'm talking about. 41 years, I've um, been knowing this guy. And um, man, he's, uh, uh, um, this guy has a real special place in my in my life, in my family. Um, he's been knowing me, man. He knows the good, the bad, the ugly about me. But one of the things I love about our relationship, we can say it's all about transformation, right? Uh, funny story, I may share a few today, but this one, I'm gonna take him back on this one. Believe it or not, this gentleman right here, he taught me how to drive stick shift. Oh, man. See, look, yeah, yeah, yeah. I learned how to uh, to drive a stick shift, man. I learned some other things just being around him, you know, watching him. And um, I, I really value this relationship. So on today, New Balance Podcast, show my boy some love for none other than my boy, Keith Crawford. Keith, say what's up to the New Balance Podcast, man. Hey, what's up to the New Balance Podcast? I'm glad to be here. I'm excited. Yeah, uh, man. Thank you. Yeah, man. I'm so glad to have you on, man. We've been talking about this for, for a minute now, and it's just good to have you on. And whenever I talk about manhood, a big part of it stems from just not having my biological father in my life, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, it left so many holes. And this is no knock, anybody that knows, this is no knock on my pops, love my pops, you know, rest in peace. But we can see when we look at society, you can look at the difference between young men who have a father and a father is present in their lives versus young men who don't have fathers, right? And so young men who don't have fathers, they don't stay young men, they grow up and they become men. And what happens is when you don't address uh, incorrect behavior, wrong behavior, it just perpetuates, right? And so, um, you know, you, um, I guess, Keith, man, we talk um, not all the time, you know, man, life is busy, man, he's a husband, he's a father, you know, um, life just, is, you know, if you live life, it's just busy. But I will tell you this, when we do talk, it is so heartfelt. And uh, it's all about you know, moving forward in our life. And one thing I love about him right now, I love that he's on this legacy. He's on this legacy. It's about legacy, you know. Um, you know, when this thing is wrapped up for me, what have I done to make life better for somebody that's coming from behind me? So um, today, man, we're going to get into some things. But um, just start, okay, man, just kind of catch me up. You know, what's been going on? Of course, I know you're working, grinding, man. You got your family. D, what's up? Shout out Dietrich, shout out Brayden, you know, uh, that's his wife and kids. So kind of bring us up to speed on what's going on in life with you, Kate. Yeah, just doing the, the working thing, you know, the, the family thing. Uh, little man stays busy. He's running track right now. Um, he have his first uh, meet next week. Uh, he has baseball going on today. My wife and my father-in-law are out at the baseball park today. Okay. He got a couple this morning. Um, uh, the wife staying busy working, you know, it's time to make this thing work. Um, right. It, it's a continual thing, you know, I think, you know, marriage, life, all of that, it, 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 and we talk about manhood, it's, it's all a continual growth, you know, I don't think there's a stopping point at anywhere in it, right. you know, all the way to life, it, it's always growing, so anything that's always growing is going to need some nurturing, so. Man. It, what we have to keep doing is nurturing it. Nurturing it, for sure. And of course, you know, I, I'm always on here shouting out, talking about each sex is, we both grew up there. And one thing about East Texas it's associated with is with work, hard work. Um, you know, one of the things I love, we both have that in common, just with our upbringing, our background, you know, our parents, our grandparents, our family, we come from that. And manhood, I see it the same way. You're only going to get out of it what you put into it, right? And um, I think just superficial things, you know, I'm not talking about... Um, 
you know, where you shop, what you buy, the things that you wear, the things that you do. I'm talking about the things that really make up the real you, right? Um, yeah. I think when you look at someone's social media page, I think you can find the real them. Yeah. On there, they share exactly how they feel. They say what they want to say, you know, what, how they look. I think that's the real person, right? Social media gives you this platform to just say whatever it is or be who you want to be. When many times, if you just would talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, you would never know that about them. So when I look at men in, in terms of the things that, that was, that's deemed to, to make us men, we know it's false, right? We know it's false. Um, you know, you grow up thinking that these things, uh, this is what makes me a man or this right here uh, defines me as a man. Um, for the audience, Keith, you know, what would your definition be? What do you, what's your definition of what makes you a man? You know, Keith Crawford, the husband, the father, the provider, the protector. What's your definition of manhood? I think it's a combination of all those things. Um, and I don't think there's one thing that defines a person as a man. Uh, but in, in my position for me, what I define it is, is just that, you know, it's somebody who gets up and, um, I don't just talk about it. I get up and do it. If there's something needs to be done around the house that um, my wife needs me to get done, I get it done. Um, I see those things. And, uh, I get them done um, as far as uh, getting up, going to work. I think it's important for young men to see adult men actually do the work as far as getting up, cutting the yard, taking out the trash, uh, going to work and uh, fixing things around the house and, and doing those things. I think there's so much value in, in a young man seeing an older man uh, do more than he just talks about. Right. Because I, as, a, as a young person, the older you get, the more you watch people and learn and the less you listen to them. Mm -hmm. I think the real lesson is, is in watching people and, and what they do. Because uh, I've got a coworker who says it best. He says, a pair of lips say anything. Um, so I, th I think more the message of being a man is, it's how you live, you know, what you do as a man. Because whether you want to admit it or not, or realize it or not, uh, young people and older people are watching. So I think yes, the way you live and actually what you do, it's really important. It is. Yeah, that's good, man. I, uh, <laughs> you said someone's a, a pair of lips to say anything. Yeah. That's yeah. powerful. That is powerful. And we all have them, right? A pair of yeah. lips to say anything. So one thing you said is... It's important uh, for young men to see older men being about it, actually doing it, working it. So when I think of things like that, I think of things that come to mind like rites of passage, right? And right. so um, I look at numbers, right? And I think we should pay attention to them, but all of the truth is not just in the numbers. But right. these particular numbers in our community, when you look at um, the numbers, 57% of young men that look like, look like you and me, they don't have that particular model at home to see going out. Now, even though my dad wasn't there, I still had a grandfather, right? Right. Other, there were surrogate fathers, right? That were in the community. Uh, I think um, I want to say it was Wednesday. I saw that um, they gave a shout out to J.W. Hutchison. Um, you know the Hutchison family in the community. Well, he, he wasn't my father. He wasn't my grandfather, but he was one of the men in the church that I went to. So I had a chance to see him in action um, in manhood, right? He not, only, I did, I not only did not did I just get to see him like function in church, but he also he worked a job. He worked at home, you know, he had, uh, he had a tractor, he had cows. So um, the relationship, even though, he, I didn't live in his house. There was still somebody that I could imitate and model. And the reason I said that is we understand that there are a lot of young men who don't have it in your house. That's not an excuse. You have to find a role model. Why did I say that? Listen, um, I always like wanted to have like an older brother, right? I had other cousins, but I didn't get to spend a lot of time with them just due to where we live, how much we got to see each other. I said that to say this, that's where our relationship came was, uh, that was so important. Now, of course, back then I couldn't articulate that to, to you, but it was like, okay, now you have this person who you can model and emulate, 
right? And so as men, some of you, just like I was, you're afraid to share how you feel. You're afraid to, to, to be open. I'm telling you, you have to open up your mouth. Now, some of the things I may say today, Keith had no idea that I wouldn't even feel that way or even was even watching him in that way. But he said it out of his mouth. People are watching. You yeah, knew that I was watching in that way, but people are watching. So it's critical what you do. Every man, I said like this, I said, everybody's watching. Everybody's watching. Yeah, when, I right. think, when I think about you now, and I, and I want to talk a lot about you today, Kate, because I think you have you have some incredible things going on in your life. And I think um, where you are in life, um, one of the things I, I admire about you is your work ethic. Um, I've seen you, you know, up close. We played sports together. I may talk about that a little later. Um, I've seen you outside of school work, um, just to know your story about you know, how you went to college, even how you did that, that is phenomenal. That's not everybody's story in terms right. of work ethic, but you're able to do it because you had a work ethic, right? right. Somebody, yeah. somebody somewhere was working, somebody was modeling, modeling these things before you so that you could have a pattern or at least a point of reference. Okay, it may not look like that, but I need to imitate this until I find out my own thing. So can you speak to that, Kate, um, taking it, and seeing it, but actually taking it and me implementing it in my life and walking it out. I think at the time, I may not have been aware that it was that many people in my life that were modeling that behavior. But as I got older and I look back over my life, um, I think when we talk about the, the father figure, we can, we can sometimes focus on just the immediate father in the house. Mm -hmm. But I think, like you said, that role can be branched out into many different um, avenues and accesses and we may not realize it at that time but you know once we get the message and later on in life we can look back over it uh one of the, probably the biggest role model in my life was my mother so Absolutely. it wasn't a man right but but she did all those things um she did it all absolutely she was the provider the protector uh the disciplinarian and she was that for sure absolutely she taught me the work ethic uh she got up and she raised seven kids by herself with no formal education um, and probably never making over twenty or $30,000 a year. And we never went without having all of our needs met. Now, we may have had some wants that weren't met, Come but on, I man. never, ever had a need that was not met wow. from a woman. So she's probably first and foremost. And then I've got some uncles that I've actually reached out to. Um, probably within the last couple of years to express to them the role that they played in my life. And like you said, they were completely unaware of the role that they had played in my life. And it was simply just them not necessarily doing something for me uh, personally, but just to model the life that I thought a man should actually be uh, living. Right. And uh, I've got several uncles, and then I've got an older brother, a couple of older brothers who modeled that. So I think there was a whole plethora of people in my life over my lifespan that that, you know, played that role for me. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm extremely grateful. And I, I think one thing, like you said, it's, it's extremely important to express to those people that they played that role in your life at some point in time. Absolutely. Because it validates their life. And I, I think not that we necessarily have to have that, but I think it's a good thing. And I think one of the most manly things you can do is to express to someone that they played that role in your life. Right. And when you stand up and acknowledge that to them. And then at that point, you realize that you can be that, that, that person. Right. So, you know, expressing to them and then you yourself then living that life that, that you, uh, that you learn from the people that you watch. So yeah, right. that was uncles, uh, brothers, cousins. Uh, that was really a village. I, I, I definitely, one of the reasons why I'm so grateful to my city and my family is because as I got older, I realized how special they were for me Absolutely. And, and how they supported me. And, and again, in the moment, I may not have realized how much and how many people were supporting me. Right. But over time, as I look back, I mean, I just probably I can't count the number of people that, you know, impacted my life uh, from the family, the community. Mm -hmm. And just my extended family of people I met along the way. Man, that's powerful. See, that's it right there. <laughs> you know, uh, we know now 
we have in essence become our parents in terms of the season of life that we're in, right? And, uh, you know, when you talk about your mother, man, I just get chill bumps. You know, the exact same story. You know, she, I don't even know if she made $20,000 a year. But yeah, I, I don't never know. Know. I don't never, I don't never remember being hungry. I had everything that I need. Every field trip we did in school, she had the money for it. You know, um, whatever I needed, whatever, you know, uh, (laughs) it wasn't until uh, I became an adult that I figured out, okay, yeah, we were, we were kind of, we were, we were down. (laughs) But in your mind, it's like, hey, mama got it, right? And so, that's a that's an attest that's a definitely a testament to um, when you look at the era that we were being raised in um, and what it took to actually what we would uh, declare being successful, right? And so I just think they had a grit about them, and I just think they had a never like a never die attitude. Like it didn't matter what showed up, they was gonna beat it. Right. right. And of course, we, we would never will never know the the depth of the things that they had to deal with. But you can look back at it now. It's like, man, you know, that's that's straight MVP uh, performance, you know, um, especially seven kids, you know, raising um, and just having to be everything to everybody. And so right. um, those are traits and characteristics of what we as men were supposed to be like. I have three kids. And uh, all of them have different needs. And sometimes it's a struggle. Now, when I say struggle, it's it's right, making sure I have the right balance, giving all of them everything that they need, right? And right. so um, to know, you know, your mom's like, she raised seven kids. And I, if I'm not mistaken, you are you are the baby, right, Kay? I'm the youngest. I'm not I mean, the baby. You're the, youngest. the youngest. I got you. I got you. That's my daughter say the same thing. I'm not the baby. I'm the youngest. But you're the youngest, right? And yes. um, it's just incredible, incredible. And when you look at the fabric of who you are, you can point back. Like you said, I can point back. We didn't know it at the time. And so right. it's, I want to dissect it and I really want to make it so plain. I don't want anybody to miss it. Like you have to stop where you are now and then you have to put it under a magnifying glass. Um, I talk to guys, man, I counsel, I coach, all, I mean, all the time three and four or five times during the week. And it's amazing. Um, These things are just being overlooked and they're not looked at, right? And I think um, we're making it, we can make manhood uh, harder than what it is, right? And so um, I was saying one of the things, you know, about you, um, you have to, you have to find somebody who's successful in something and just imitate it. Right. Yeah. It imitated. Now we're we're teenagers. We're, you know, we're young boys, young men, you know, growing up. So I, I want to switch to sports. Um, so I know, and I want to talk about a term because I really want to hear you elaborate on it. So we played all three sports. You played four, four, five, every sport Westwood had, you played it. So let's just <laughs> let's just put it there. You know, I did have an off season. I don't know if you I don't know yeah. if you an off season. You played. Sports for sports, but um, I'm a, I'm gonna I'm a throw a term out to you, and I want you to address it. So, um, in football, we both played the same position, receiver, right? right. And on defense, you play strong safety. I play cornerback. So, um, my pride and joy was on the offensive side of the ball. I didn't want to play defense at all, yet I was out there. This is a term that I want you to address as it relates to manhood. As a receiver, we every play has a route. You either run a route or you have a blocking assignment. When it is a route that's ran, um, a play to be thrown to, there's a term for the quarterback and receiver. And it's this. It's called you throw the receiver open. In other words, you don't throw the ball where the receiver is running. You throw the ball where the receiver is going to be. And I think in life, when it comes to manhood, when we look at whatever model you look at um, for manhood, many times we look at, we see it where manhood is versus where we should be in manhood. 
So if you, you ever look at a throw and play, I don't care if it's college, high school, pro, the quarterback, when they throw the ball, the ball is always thrown to the destination where the receiver should be. That's why he runs a route. So when you look at manhood, Kay, how would you describe manhood in terms of being thrown open versus just running, right? If you if you if you get what I'm saying, I want you to talk talk to that particular statement. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. You know, in, in football, you know, the average fan that hasn't participated in probably a high level of sports may not even understand that concept. Uh, but it definitely relates to to life, and and it's basically the quarterback putting the ball where you're gonna be versus where you actually are. Right. And your job is to understand that you've got to get to that final destination in order to make the catch. Yes, sir. And I, I think that definitely translates over to to uh, life itself. And I think as the model figure, the way that concept would work is simply when we look at young adults or young people who are just not where we think they should be. Right. It's not you to take them to the ending spot, but it's to give them the tools to get there. So I think if we give the young people or the people who are just not where we think they should be in life, right. if we give them those tools in order to get there and teach them how to apply those tools to life, in essence, what we're doing is we're throwing them open. Mm. Because when they have the tools to get there, they can now use them. And, and that's what we, we don't realize with a lot of young kids. You know, when, when you're mentoring young kids, you know, we can regurgitate all this stuff we learn. But if we don't sit down and tell them how, it, how it's applicable to life, and um, then we miss the, the point itself. So we can, we can tend to, to get to bragging about where we are in life and what we have. And we miss the message on, you know, how it, how it is to attain all that stuff. And it, it's simply, I, I think the word success is a very loosely used term. Yes. I, I, I think it, it's something that has to be put in context on, on your life. Mm -hmm. You know, you, again, my mom never made, I would be willing to bet she never made over twenty or $30,000 a year. And she's probably the most successful person I've ever met. And I've met people who are quote unquote millionaires. Right. So, Again, success has got to be de defined and, you know, it, it's, it's put in perspective. So, you know, we, we talk about what success is. And, and when we put in perspective and it applies to our life directly, I think we can focus in on it and then it can be achieved. Um, we too often get caught up in what somebody else has or what somebody else is doing. Right. Or in this society now, we look at TV um, and we think that's what success is. But a right. lot of times those people are, as unhappy or even unhappier than we are. Um, so when, when we when we when we set goals and talk about success, I, I think for me where I am in life, I sat down and decided what's important to me, right, and what I want out of life. Mm -hmm. My wife and I, and, and we look to achieve that. Right. And it has absolutely nothing to do with what our neighbors has, the person around the street, the person right. on TV. It has absolutely nothing to do with what they have, right. We decide what it takes for us to achieve that. And then our son, we teach him what it takes to achieve that. And again, we throw him open by giving him those tools. Man. To do whatever he wants. Right, right. Man, now, okay, I, okay, I want to, I want to, I want to stay right there. So I'm speaking to whoever's watching, but specifically men. Now, one of the things, too, and I'm telling you, I, I use the term men, but I'm talking about myself because I can talk about right. I can talk about him better than anybody else. There was a time in my life where I felt like I wasn't being thrown open fast enough. Right. Yeah. And I know that there's a struggle for men that's dealing with that. Now, I want to use the same example about the same same scenario. So what do I mean by that? What does it look like? OK. So we're both playing the same um, position, right? And um, hands down, you're the number one option on our offense, period. So, you know, uh, I know our coach, he may see this. So coach, don't, you know, this ain't personal. But for sake of this podcast, I'm going to use this example. I'm going to tell you, it used to cook my grits the way our offense was set up. We didn't have all the fancy play calling like you see now. They got signs. They doing all kind of – we didn't have that, homeboy. We had two receivers. I run. I take the play in. 
The next play, the receiver come, we just ran it back. That's how we did it. Man, when it was a pass play call, the ball <laughs> was going to Crawford, right? And, man, I would be like, man, man when you going to call my number? You done threw the ball to Crawford? You, you, you know, you done already threw it to him three times. I want you to call ADZ. Call something for me. And I'm telling you, I would be in my feelings. Now, watch this. Now, watch this. Now, at bay, like you said, you used the example, somebody sitting in the stands who, who doesn't really know the game, doesn't know the sports, man, it's like, dang, man, they should throw the ball. They've been throwing the ball to number 20. Why don't they throw the ball to number nine, right? But they're not knowing you done paid the price. You understand? You done paid. You, you already been on varsity longer than I have, right? You came up, you got to play up on varsity early, which a lot of players don't get to do. You can put in the time. And so when your season came, it's your time to shine. Now, this was the thing that I wasn't thinking about. For me, I need to learn everything that I need to learn because the following year, I'm going to get a chance to assume the role. But many times we don't see the place, the destination, right? We're so focused on where we are and where we're running. All I had to do was learn whatever lesson, whatever ball, I got thrown. And it wasn't like I wasn't getting balls thrown. I was getting a few balls thrown. But when I thought I should have been getting the ball, man, we used to, listen, we used to joke about that. You know, I see in his eyes, hey, I know he's going to call Keith number, man. Hey, hey, Hickerson. Hey, Hickerson. <laughs> Run 80 out and up. I'm like, man, tell hey, tell Jeremy to look for Crawford. Tell him, tell, I'm saying to myself, dog, no, he needs to look for Hickerson. <laughs> he needs to look for Hickerson, God dog. Well, I'm just telling you, that's, uh, you know, sometimes it can be like a selfish thing. And I'm, when I talk about the rites of passage, it's a, it's a terrible thing when you get to a place before it's time. And I know also, because I had a baby, man, 18, 18 years old. It <laughs> wasn't the time for me to have the baby. Now, there was a time and the designated place that it would have been perfect for me to have a child, but not when I'm getting ready to go off to school to go play ball. That's not the time to have the baby. But I, I find myself with a baby at 18, 19 years old, right? And my life is just beginning, right? I hadn't even been away from home a year. So yeah. I know what it's like from a natural standpoint to get ahead of yourself before the time. So when you say that, because you said this, sometimes we think or we, we, may, we may criticize them because we're, we're saying we don't think they're in a place that they should be. Right. And that is the case sometimes. I, I be yeah. harder. Sometimes that's one of the problems, uh, which what they call OGs or old heads, you know. Um, I, I and I've done it before, man. Been on them so hard. It's like, man, you know what? Looking back at it, you need to go back, apologize, give them some grace. They working on it. Remember you, you was a work in progress, right? right? So I do, I do get it, but you have to, you have to go through the process. You do have to go through the process of getting to the destination point. And so, uh, man, Keith, man, I, I would like for you to just talk a little bit even about that. Um, obviously, man, you was very successful in school um, through sports, you know, you, um, you went to college. If you could just talk about that high school and college journey, like how you had to do it, I think it would just really help men, man, even young men who desire to go to school, you don't even have to be to play ball, but you just have a desire to go to school. Sometimes it's not, it doesn't look the way we think it does. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's funny that you say that because um, from the outside looking in, everybody thinks it was, you know, the glory story of, of the way my sports uh, career took off and the way it actually happened. But, you know, when, when you were in the trenches with me, you understand it. There was nothing glorious about it to me. You know, going through the process, uh, right. I, once, once it was over, I was able to look back and, you know, appreciate it. But, you know, the process for me at that point, um, you were talking about you wanted the ball. Well, I actually went to college to play defense. So, um, and I was not recruited at all for football. So absolutely no one recruited me for football. I was recruited for baseball and track. I had a, a, an opportunity to go play baseball, but that was obviously not something I wanted to do. But it was the only sport that I was recruited in. Wow, so I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I did not. Yeah. I did no. not know that. You know, the I way it was. Offers. Man, I did not you know that, man. That's yeah. powerful. See, that gives the story even more. Uh, pr go ahead, man. Share your story, man. That's so, powerful. So the way it actually worked is 
Howard Payne's coach, Bill Anderson, used to coach at Westwood. Wow. So when Jack Cherry, the principal, we called him Coach Cherry, who was right. a coach, you know, well before our time. Absolutely. coached on the same staff, or he was a player on the same team that Bill Anderson was a coach. So they had a relationship. So Coach Cherry and Bill Anderson connected, and that was my link to Howard Payne. It was not because I was doing so great on the field that Howard Payne reached out to me, but it was because of their connection that actually got me to Howard Payne. And it was not on the offensive side of the ball. It was actually as a safety. Now, I could believe that now. I Hold on. Let, let, me, let me put the pin at. Listen, he said that. Let me put some previous. We were playing a game. This is no, no fluff. Team was driving on us, and my told you played free safety. Team get ready to score. They run like a sweep, like from the five-yard line. Man, Keith come down. Man, he hit this guy so hard at the one-yard line. When he hit the guy, the guy went lifeless. I mean, the guy was laying there. He wasn't moving. The game was stopped for like 15 minutes before the guy finally started moving. So this is what's funny. Our, our secondary and receiver coach today was Coach Rick Ribley. So <laughs> obviously, Keith hit him so hard, it he would – you were stunned. You were sitting in the end zone, your helmet off. You weren't talking to anybody. You were just sitting by yourself. You was looking at the guy. And so Coach Ribley called me over and said, hey, Hickerson, hey, you're going to have to go in and get Crawford. He, I don't know where he is right now. You're going to have to go get him. I told him, I'm not going to get Crawford. I ain't going in on the defense, man. I, ain't, I don't have nothing to do with it. I run offense. No, Keith going to be fine. I had to share that story. So when you say defense, I believe it. I've seen, I, I know but I thought it was on the offensive side of the ball. Go ahead, man. I just wanted to put yeah. that. Yeah, hey. part, part of it was, you know, at the time, I thought I was all that. But as I look back over, you know, I realized that, you know, I, I was actually a really late bloomer as far as physical growth. So I didn't hit a growth spurt until I actually got to college. Right. So I was upsized. And, um, you know, for what we had, I was decent. But when you compare it, and this is what I think most young men don't do is, when you go from the high school to the college level, right. you may be good at your school and in your area, but you're no longer competing at your school in your area when you go to college. You're now competing on the national level. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes we get lost in ourselves, you know, on that local level, and we don't apply it to the national level. And that, that's one of the things that I think I did because in my mind, I, there was no way that some D1 school should not have been calling me for something. Yeah. Absolutely. But as I look back, I can absolutely understand why absolutely no D1 school was calling because I was undersized, underskilled, and right. I just had growth spurt. And I didn't have what it takes to play D1 ball at that time. Right. And I probably didn't have the, the mental makeup to do it as well. So um, my, my plan was laid out, and it was laid out for a purpose, and, and the timing worked the way it should have worked. So I ended up going to Howard Payne as a safety and after two or three days in practice, the receiver line was so short, um, coach actually just threw me in the receiver line um, wow. just to, to make up enough people to have, you know, running scout teams and uh, just to run the plays. Um, and it actually worked out. So from that point on, um, I got in that receiver line and I never left it. And slowly but surely, I moved from the back of that line to the front of that line, wow. you know, within a couple of weeks of practice. And um it, it kind of took off, and um, I had a, a decent season that first year. I got hurt toward the end of the year, um, which actually was another growth period for me because I was actually on the sideline. After earning a starting position, I went back to the sideline, you know, with the injury, which, again, uh, you know, it, you know, in hindsight, it, it was for a reason to, to get me to, to refocus again and to hone in on what was important and what I should have been doing. Right. Uh, so I hit the weight room at that point, you know, rehabbing the knee. Uh, no surgeries, thank God. But, you know, I rehabbed the knee for a couple of weeks and came back the last game. And then the next year I hit the growth spurt and then everything kind of took off from that point. Um, wow. Incredible. Man, talk to um, – talk about this student athlete. Um, uh, I, I, I had a chance to, um, to be a student athlete in college. Um, but understanding – I want to talk about um, this term, the scholarship. Um, I'm so glad you shared that because I, I never knew that, uh, Kay. Um, my story is similar. When I left, of course, I went to, I moved to this area and was going to community college. 
And uh, I made up in my mind because you said, did nobody, <laughs> you didn't get in the office. I, I don't even want to talk about what I got. Well, what, what, what nothing, right? But I, I remember this. There was, um, there was a coach that was there from Abilene Christian College. And he was at, he was at our, I want to say, I think it was uh, the Fairfield game. Okay. Now, check this out. They were there watching Tony Brackett's. Everybody was watching Tony Everybody Brackett. was watching Tony Brackett's. But <laughs> my senior year, I think he was a freshman or sophomore. I can't remember. But I had a great game. I had a great game against Fairfield, man. I, I, I killed Fairfield. And um, Coach, uh, you remember Coach Westmoreland? Yeah. He and Coach Westmoreland, he told me, he said, he said, if you, you know, if you were to put in the work, work, he said, you could, you could go play football, you know, at the college level, you know, but you need to do A, B, C, and D. So my plan, I didn't tell nobody, but my mom said, look, I'm going to move down. You know, I'm going to go to college in the mainland. I'm going to work out. And I said, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a year, work on myself, everything. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to go walk on at TSU. In my mind, that was realistic. I said, I think I could do that. Now, mind you, um, really, basketball was my sport. But because of me not being responsible, getting my grades, I never got a chance to blossom as a basketball player. People talk to me all the time, but people don't know. I only played one year of basketball at Westwood my senior year. The year I should have played, your senior year, I, my junior, that really would have been the year. But the other years, I played part of the season, and I messed up because of grace. So I wouldn't even focus on that. So you fast forward, I'm in college. Guy, guys, we're working out. There's some other guys that's going. They're going to U of H, but I want to go to TSU. So we work out together, you know. I also hit a growth spurt in height. When I graduated, I was five six, and like a year, I went from five six to five ten and a half. I took a growth spurt. I put on like I was one fifty five when I graduated. I put on like thirty some pounds. I hit a growth spurt, yeah. and so, man, I was like, man, I wish I was this high when I was in school. Yeah. But yeah, now, yes, man, I was this. That was my dream. So anyway, I got into some trouble. Ended up getting a young lady pregnant. Man, God bought this guy in my life. And I talk about him in my book named Al Bass, Coach Bass. And, man, he was just a loving, guiding hand. Tough love. Right. But he helped me, man. And he told me, he told me, he had to tell me the tough thing. He said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, I think it'd be a waste of time for you to try to walk on and go play football. He said, I watch you in this gym. He said, you don't even know it. You're playing against guys that's playing college ball. They come here to play. He said, man, you divvy them up every time. He said, why not go play basketball? He said, man, you you would be a great guy. You ought to think about it. So anyway, I'm not paying no attention, man, because where we come from, we play football. Everybody go play football. Who playing football? You playing Herb and Tulsa, Deshaun. We got guys everywhere, man. So it's like I I, I can't go back home unless I'm playing football. I'm just being straight up with you. I'm going to go home. I'm going to have my TSU Whatever, and I'm be telling the cast I yeah. play for the Tigers. Period. I'm just being right. straight with you. I'm being straight with you. That's where I was, but man, it took him putting that spotlight on me. And then this, not only that, this is what he did. I didn't know he had a relationship. You talk about Coach Cherry. He had a relationship with the president of Paul Quinn College in Dallas, oh. Dr. Morgan. He said, "Man, I, he said, I tell you what, spring break. He said we're gonna go to Dallas." On his own dime, he said, we're going to go to spring. He said, we're going to go to Dallas. We're going to go down there for the weekend. He said, you don't need no money. Pack your clothes. We're going. Man, we went down. We left early. Got to Paul Quinn that Friday morning. He introduced me to Dr. Morgan. They took me on the tour of the campus, and they started having this conversation. He said, hey, Dr. Morgan, y'all, they had Paul Quinn just won the national championship. He said, hey, Dr. Morgan, um, uh, you, I remember you saying you need some guards, right? So yeah, we graduating guards, man, and we're short. So I mean, this young man right here is a fine guard. Da, 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 da. Man, Keith, long story short, we went down to the gym. I met Coach Summers, and I tried out for the team that day. Made it. They decided to bring me on. That's how I got the Paul Quinn. <laughs> somebody had somebody opened that door for me. Right. right. So you say, well, you guys were, you know, y'all are young men, but the principal 
of someone else coming in to assist you, you have to have it in life. He shared his story. I shared my story. Why am I sharing it? Sometimes as men, we have our minds made up. It's like, I don't need anybody else. I'm a man just like you're a man. And this almost, I'd rather bump my head, miss it, and fail than allow somebody to help me get to the place.